I'd like to welcome to the JPP, Howard Goldstein. Howard is the national and international chairman of the board of Israel Bonds, as well as senior partner at Citroen Cooperman, one of the nation's largest professional services firms. With more than 50 years of experience as a certified public accountant, Howard has broad knowledge in all tax strategies and planning for corporations, partnerships, individuals, and startup companies. Howard is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants, New Jersey Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and State of New Jersey Board of Certified Public Accountants. So tell me, Howard, if you don't mind, in your own words, tell me a little bit just about who you are. Tell me a little bit about your life. Well, um, I'm very uh, blessed with a lot of uh, things in my life. Uh, I grew up, uh, my history is I grew up in pretty good poverty. Uh, my dad passed away when I was 10. My little brother was two. Uh, it was uh, a little struggle. We grew up in uh, rent control and food stamps and and things. And I really didn't know much about Israel except for when I went to uh, Cheder, uh when I was young and prepared for my bar mitzvah. By the time my bar mitzvah came, my dad had died. Uh, but I always wanted to, and my mother has always taught me, may she rest in peace, uh, to make a difference, to do something that you can uh, partially uh, change what you don't think is right or make something that you think is right, make it better. And that's really been my uh, uh, MO for uh, a long time. So I grew up like that. Uh, I had moved to uh, Florida. Uh, I was with my wife. And when we came down, we wanted to do something uh special we wanted to attach uh to uh, a jewish community jewish professionals and something that was really righteous and something in my mind that connected to israel why because they never connected to israel and i thought it was important and everything you read and whether it's a sitter whether it's uh, an article uh about anything uh jewish it's always about yerushalayim it's always about eric israel it's always about Am Israel Chai. And I wanted to connect like that. So uh, we did. And I'm not a sideline player, never have been, either in sports or business. I, you know, in managing partners, chairman, presidents. And I wanted to take an active role in leadership. So I did. So we were down here uh, since uh, 81, 42 years ago. Wow. Uh, my bride and I have been down here. And we, uh, you know, started uh, our family. Uh, they're now active. My two boys, uh, my daughter isn't, but are, uh, but they're active in Israel bonds. They go speaking. Uh, I guess they, uh, picked up the trickle at the breakfast table. Uh, I don't, I didn't want them to be like me. I wanted to be them to be like them. Mm -hmm. And my wife is also active in Israel bonds, uh, Marcy and anything she can grab her hands on to, to make life better you know, uh, for the Jewish people and make a difference. So we first started to lead missions, uh, delegations, as we call it in Israel, bonds, not missions. Um, and we started with new leadership and new leadership is very close, very near and very dear to our hearts. Uh, uh, so we started uh, leading national delegations. I've been probably doing that, goodness, 35 years. Uh, anywhere from 75 people. We had huge new leadership delegations at one time of 250 people, 300 people, uh, with three trips to Poland and Hungary and Russia. And we, I wanted to have everybody uh, inhale a terrific experience of how it is to be Jewish. I wanted to go to Poland, then to uh, Israel. You know, I've been on the march three times. And I wanted to, them to see what it is to go from dark to light. Right. That was real important to me. I appreciate that. It reminds me when I was uh, a teenager. So I think, I think my parents took me to Israel when I was in 11th grade for the very first time in my life. And in 12th grade, I participated in the March of the Living that you alluded to. Mm -hmm. And that amazing contrast of, of darkness to light, which is, of course, the contrast that we are very much uh, the battle that we're very much fighting, uh, you know, besides on the battlefield uh, in Gaza and up north, also on the battlefield of public opinion. 
and the battlefields uh, that are raging all across the world right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely that theme of, of, of light and darkness. I'd love to ask you, Howard, tell me about your very first trip to Israel. How old were you? What was that experience like? Very first trip to Israel. I mean, let, let me as an accountant uh, count count backwards. Uh, it was uh, I was thirty three. Okay, thirty three years old, um, and we went on a uh, new leadership delegation. I would tell you that I've met some of my nearest and closest friends for the last thirty five years on that trip. I met uh, people who eventually became chairman of the board, like me. I met uh, people who were my lifelong once a week friends, and it was and, and a lot of them uh, were met on the uh, back of a bus in Jerusalem, telling stories, getting to know one another, and that was my first uh, experience. The uh, the problem with going to Israel uh, for the first time is you can only do it once. Uh -huh. it was so expanding of my mind and affected my wife and I so much that that was just part of my DNA. And I wanted to make a difference. And I met the who's who's with Israel bonds and uh, prime ministers. I sat on daises with all the prime ministers over the last 35 years. I am blessed. This is a little poor Jewish kid from New Jersey originally. So uh, that was my first experience. And it has not stopped. I've probably been to Israel uh, probably close to 60 times, uh, sometimes very quick. Because now we go to meet the finance minister for a day, uh, prime minister for a day. So uh, it's good. And I think it's my responsibility. I've inhaled that and uh, demanded that of myself and our family. That's our responsibility to bring Israel into a great light and an ongoing light. It's it's interesting. I'm actually as you're talking about these delegations, I'm I'm realizing that I've been invited a number of times as a I'm a rabbi. I've been invited a number of times on these rabbinic delegations by Israel Bonds, if I'm not mistaken. I think actually in February. I haven't I've never partaken yet. In February. I've been invited a number of times now that now that you're mentioning it. Yeah, no, it's uh it's good. And we have many divisions in Israel Bonds, uh, you know, to uh, get engaged. Whoever they whoever you are. Wherever you are, whatever you want to do, we have the niche for you to follow. And uh, are there participants on these delegations who it's their first trip to Israel? Like, are there people like that? Sure, some were, some were multiple, you know, and some um, with new leadership. All the older people when I was younger, uh, when they were, you know, uh, Alta Cockers, which I guess I'm an Alta Cocker now, I guess, I'm a grandfather. Even, even I'm an Alta Cocker. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So uh, I think that's important, and they all got their energy from new leadership. They all got gas in their tank from being around young people, spirited people. You know, the zeal, the emotion, the passion has been remarkable, and that's why I'm very proud to put, uh, you know, all my weight and all my uh, budget money that I can uh, behind new leadership um, events, uh, grooming. I believe uh, wholeheartedly that the key to your success is how you groom your successors. And when we have uh, boards, what I've transformed the boards in the half a decade so far that I've been chairman uh, of the board is to uh, make a younger board, a more vibrant board, uh, see that you can rise to an elevated position in the Israel bonds. And we don't take an, an onboard uh, any old people onto the board. We love them. We need them. And the average age of the bond buyer now, which I'm trying to bring down, is 63 years old. The average age. So we need to really push that needle downward. And that's the, and that's the key for our future. If you believe in Lador of Ador, that's where it is. And if you don't, you better think again for us organizations that I see around. And I speak to many chairman of boards from many great organizations. I'm on the board of the, uh, uh, the Conference for Jewish Presidents. And I say, you have to be younger or this is not going to last. So I'm not going to let that happen. Excellent. Let me ask you, Howard, if you can explain a little bit to our audience. Obviously, we're in you know, pressing times of need right now in Israel. 
Israel Bonds is always functioning, as you mentioned, for many, many years we've been involved. Talk a little bit about the 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 contrast or Israel Bonds, quote unquote, in normal times, peacetime, we'll call it, if there's ever such a thing in Israel, and normal times uh, in times of war, uh, which is not normal times, abnormal times. Uh, right. the, the new normal. Tell us a little bit about the differences. And the, the new normal? Yeah. Uh, uh, sure. The, uh, I mean, to me, you know, leading an organization with our uh, president and CEO, Danny Neve, uh, is a very different time because things just get ratcheted up that much faster. Uh, before October 7th, by October 6th, funny, by Friday afternoon, close of business, we had hit a billion dollar mark in Israel bonds before the war started. We've done that consistently for almost 10 years, but here we've never done it sooner than we ever did by October 6th. Then you wake up in the morning on Shabbat and on October 7th, now we have a war. And I've never been, I've been through intifadas, I've ran over there, you know, and, and huddled into King David as they came back from my, you know, Iraq and all of that but never been in a war. So now, starting on Saturday night, Sunday, strategy meetings, we ratcheted it up. We did close to, in the four weeks after, I know we're finished our fifth week, but the four weeks after uh, Israel bonds started its war campaign, we'll call it, we did a billion dollars in four weeks. What we did, you know, uh, all through the first nine months in one week. Uh, why? Let me, let me just let me interject for one second. And those are presumably, uh, I'll call uh, past investors buying more. Those are fresh investors. In terms yes of to all your questions. Yes to all your statements. We have a lot of new investors. We did a campaign for people who didn't know what Israel bonds were like. Our media um, uh, people were phenomenal. We were getting messages out. I was on the screen at nauseum with a lot of our constituency, uh, the ones who knew about it, the ones who didn't know about it, uh, institutions such as uh, many, 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 many state uh, treasuries uh, for relationships we've had with the controller of many, many states, uh, probably easily in excess of 20 states uh, during that period of time. They were big buyers. Uh, some hadn't bought before. Some increased what they had bought the previous nine months. And then as a result, uh, we had a lot of new, what we call retail, what we call individuals who hadn't bought before. We had people who hadn't bought for a while because they didn't like things that were going on in, in Israel. Okay. So we're not a political organization. We never have been a political organization. I will never let it be a political, organiz political organization. But they said, this is Israel. So, you know, I've always contended that the state of Israel is just not a state, but it's a state of mind. And that's where we have to get all the Jews from the diaspora to understand, be educated, that there's a difference. Okay? It's not the government. It is the state of Israel. It's a state of mind. So uh, I think for Jews in diaspora, the biggest maybe conflict that we have is we don't live in Israel. I appreciate Israel. I love it. I embrace it. I uh, nurture it as much as I can. But Israel Bonds gives me the ability to make an economic aliyah to Israel. I can make an investment in Israel. I can uh, do something on behalf of Israel. I can increase uh, the gross national product. I can do all those things sitting right here in Miami. And I think that's important. And you can do that the same way in New York, Los Angeles, and Texas, all over. And we are international, so we have a wrong campaign in Canada, Mexico, and in Europe. Very, very big in uh, UK, France, and Germany. So that is the way that uh, I think we have to uh, keep on pushing what we're doing. And uh, you know, like I've uh, I've said to people uh, in all my years, uh, you know, because I can't act exactly sell a bond. I'm not a licensed sales rep. We're under FINRA, SEC. But I say 
that you uh, don't buy a bond. Uh, you don't buy a bond until it hurts. You buy a bond until it feels good. And that's my mantra for any kind of philanthropy. You buy it, you know, until it feels good, not when it hurts. And that gives you uh, perpetuity. That gives you a forever uh, client. And who want, who doesn't want to be a client of Eretz Yisroel, okay, if you're Jewish? Interesting. So let me ask you this. I'm curious. I happen to personally be a member of the Orthodox Jewish community. I don't hear so many, although I, I, you know, I shouldn't say I don't hear so much. I used to live in Manhattan. I heard a little more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, amongst the different denominations of Judaism, is is uh, is one denomination more invested, less invested? I'm curious in particular about the Orthodox. Is there more work to be done with the Orthodox or are they already super invested? What's the... Uh, what's your... more, you know what? There's more work to be done with all denominations. Okay. Okay. And just for an editorial fact, 35% approximately of all bonds that are sold are to non-Jews. Really? Fascinating fact, huh? Well, Christians, uh, Christians are very, you know, are very, very supportive of Israel, so I'd imagine. Christians, uh, financial institutions, uh, there's lots of ways that uh, bonds have gravitas. <clears throat> what they do for a living, what they do for a cause, what kind of capital, political capital, economic capital, moral capital, that they want to do an investment in Israel bonds. So that's kind of like an astounding figure I always keep track of. And our new, new leadership group grows with leaps and bounds all the time. We have thousands and thousands of people involved in new leadership podcasts that you can go blurry from all the things that are uh, coming out and video and, uh, and uh, uh, many, many uh, events. So I think that's um, important, important to know. So we uh, we do capture so many sectors of the Jewish diaspora, including the non-Jewish diaspora, I call it. Got it. Got it. So uh, I'm curious, in, in this time of need, so amazingly, like you just expressed, you raised a billion dollars in, <laughs> in about four weeks, matching the entire you know previous part of the year of the campaign. And our job's not done yet. Uh, of course not. I'm curious, though, you know, we all are experiencing kind of like uh, we we'll call it request overload in terms of there's so many crucial organizations in Israel that are asking for, you know, much deserved and much needed resources. People, of course, have to triage. Now, obviously, this is a little bit different, right? My, you could correct me if I'm wrong or you can explain it kind of simply, right? A bond is not giving your money. You know, anytime you give charity, this is not charity, right? This is a little bit different. This is this is an investment. You're going to get a return on this investment. Usually when you give called stucca, right? Charity, you get you get a spiritual return on that on that money. You you get a good feeling inside, but you're not necessarily getting the money back. The but, tax but the tax yeah, tax. okay, 100%. I'm curious, so like, you know, if somebody says to you right now, and I'm like, you know, I'm getting, I'm, I'm just picking an organization near and dear to my heart, like United Hatsala or, I love um, you know, like, like, so if somebody says I can only give to one or the other, what's the, what's the argument? I mean, what, what's the, what's the pitch? Why, why is this at the highest priority right now? I came up with an answer for that because okay. I asked myself the same question. And we came up with a concept that I was part of that called the Shalom Bond. And it, we call it kind of a double mitzvah. So I engaged, which I engaged with the finance ministry all the time, that we have a bond now that you can uh, say, I want to do it with uh, Hatzala. I want to do it with uh, Bogan David Adon. I want to give it so it gets to the ambulatory, the, the medical, all those other things, because Israel bonds basically is within 48 hours of buying a bond, is in, in the treasury of Israel, okay? And they disperse it just like tax revenue goes into the treasury in the United States for whatever fills their budget. So we came up with a concept which is working with leaps and bounds right now that let's say you wanted to do uh, a Mogan David Adon. Uh, I have over, four, over 500 501c3 charitable organizations that will accept a Israel bond as a donation, including, and more, and just as importantly, many universities who sometimes balk at that, who will now accept an Israel bond as their donation. 
So you fill out a form, you buy an Israel bond and designate where you want that bond to go to. And within 48 hours, it goes to the charity. And that's how you can buy a bond, give it to the charity, and there you go. You've now donated to, uh, you know, uh, a Mogan Dove at a Dome. You bought your Israel bond, and it's a double mitzvah. Very powerful. And that's how we counter that. And it, it's a fabulous working thing, and it's a concept. Concept. Right. So, and I, there's so many phenomenal organizations in, in our country. We are really blessed. Uh, again, I sit on the board of the Conference for Presidents. You know, uh, amazing. And the people who head these are amazing also. So nobody's left out. This is just happens to be investment, but you can designate it to your charity. I love it. Great. Brilliant, brilliant concept. I know that the Conference of Presidents had a mission like immediately after October 7th. Were you a participant? Yes. No, no. Okay. Uh, and the reason I wasn't, the same reason that I didn't have a mission or a delegation from Israel Bonds, is we are so busy with our staff and our lay leaders and also, my humble opinion, uh, the ministers I did talk to over in Israel, they're busy running a war. They don't need me to see them and grab five minutes of, uh, you know, a baklava and a Turkish coffee. They don't need that from me. Right. Uh, we're doing, you know, so many millions and millions of dollars on a daily basis that I wanted to uh, keep our eye on the ball. I think those missions were fabulous. Okay. Uh, Kola Kavod, I've been in plenty of uh, solidarity missions, but uh, this is a war, and they don't need me patching around in their offices because I know them, I appreciate them, I love them for everything they're doing. Uh, this is not a thankful job for me. This is our responsibility, and I want it to be efficient, and so I decided not to have one of these solidarity missions. We will and we'll go and we'll do some of the normal things and work. And we'll work on a farm. We'll work on picking fruit from a tree. We'll do those things because we had a phenomenal mission uh, sold out <clears throat> months in advance uh, that was leaving about a week or so after October 7th. Oh, wow. Huge, huge. Right. Uh, meeting the, the best of the rest, everything. I won want, I want Deus, my opening night at the hotel, in the hotel, underneath the hotel, we had Bibi, we had the mayor of Jerusalem, the finance minister. We had who's who in and underneath that new venue at the hotel. Uh, first organization to have that also, too. And we've done uh, other things, which now we've, we've grabbed gravitas. We were the first major organization. I replicated the um, Abraham Accord. So we went to Dubai. Um, then we went to uh, we went to all the UAEs, and then we ended up in the living room at his house with uh, Bougie Herzog. Oh wow, beautiful! I want to I, I want to I wanna diverge a little bit. Same topic, but a little bit away from Israel bonds. Just from talking to somebody who who has been a leader for many years and somebody who is a leader in, in, in different capacities, and particularly you mentioned Conference of Presidents. i just love to hear some of your opinions on what's going on today on college campuses in the United States of America. I've had, a, actually, I'm releasing an episode today of, uh, of, a, of a mega philanthropist who uh, wrote one of those letters withdrawing his support um, mm. for the Ivy League institutions. And uh, I'd just love to hear some, some words of wisdom from you, Howard, in terms of what you're seeing in America today, both on college campuses and beyond, uh, just your thoughts, your feelings on what we're experiencing in terms of the, the 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 hatred and the vitriol that is seemingly being you know thrust in our in our faces. Yeah, um, it is uh, egregious. Uh, it has been suppressed for a long time. Uh, growing up Jewish, uh, if you didn't see any of this racism, then you weren't out there. Uh, you can sense it, you can smell it, but it wasn't as aggressive and it wasn't out there like it is today. I think the people who are protesting on college campuses are not educated to what Israel is, what Israel stands for. I think some of this has become fashionable, for the lack of better words, with you know younger people. Uh, will it subside? 
I think our task here as Jewish leaders and as Jews is first of all, get more Jewish people in the diaspora involved. There still is an apathy. There still is not an urgency. They're still not doing things as an emergency. They're just not. So my is uh, my uh, raison d'etre is to get them engaged, get them to educated people on the campus, get them to talk to the uh, board of trustees on colleges, uh, large uh, donors. That's sometimes what we've done with our Israel bonds. Uh, we're going to give it an Israel bonds. Well, we don't want to take an Israel bond in our portfolio. Then you're not getting my donation. And that has moved the chess pieces around over the last couple of years since we've uh, uh, initiated, you know, a bonds for university campaign. So it's education of the young people. Uh, it's education of the powers that be at the board level, at the contribution level, at the alumni level, and never stop. So it's out there. And I think on October 7th, uh, Israel changed. Uh, that'll never be the same as it was on October 6th. And I think any Jew in the diaspora, whether they know it or they haven't realized it, but they will, that you as a Jew in the diaspora have also a uh, paradigm shift into something new by October 7th. Yeah, I'll just share some of my own experience. Please. You know, I'm I'm 51 years old. I grew up in I grew up on Long Island here in New York. I really didn't, you know, experience uh, frontal anti-Semitism. You know, nothing really blatant that I can recall. I uh, I worked at a very prominent law firm at a time in my early in my career at Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. Just to give you a sense, I mean, I know many people didn't wear wear yarmulkes in uh, in law firms, but I wore a yarmulke, uh, like similar to the one I'm wearing today. And not only that, but the amount of respect and deference. I, I still remember that the at the end of the summer, when we were all summer associates between our second and third year of law school, so it happened to be Al Gore was running for president. He was the vice president. He he ultimately lost. His daughter, Karenna Gore Schiff at the time, was uh, my office. She had the office right next to mine. And uh, you know the firm was so sensitive to my observance when they were taking out like a whole group of associates at the end of the summer, we all went, they all went to La Marais to a kosher restaurant out mm -hmm. of deference to me. So nice. I, you know, it's like, to me, America is like, you know, is, is this, you know, it's this shining city on the hill. It's this place where, where, uh, you know, where, where all religions, where there's tremendous tolerance and appreciation and to see what we're seeing, you know, I went to, I went to Ivy league schools. I was on those campuses. It's just, it, to me, it's like, it's, it's just, it's, it's, I wonder maybe people older than me, they felt growing up and maybe it's not as shocking to them. For me, it's like, it's like, where did this come from? It's really like astounding. Well, you know, a lot of times, some of us in, in certain uh, uh, metropolitan areas grew up in a bubble, just did. Other places didn't, okay? I grew up in a little bubble, but I had many, many uh, anti-Semitic, anti-white racial things. I just thought that was just part of America, and you toughed it, and you stood up for what you believe. Right. And I've always been taught to stay, you know, stand up for what you believe. Uh, and if part of the belief is uh, wearing a yarmulke, then that's part of the belief. Is it uh, doing things um, uh, with uh, Jewish organizations, uh, making a statement, not being afraid to make a statement? We're not being afraid to be on a podcast, okay, that's going to go into a media. And I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of who I am, and I want my family to be very proud of who they are. I think having a Jewish identity is critical. Uh, I've always said that if I come back in my next life, you believe that, I want to come back uh, uh, with three things. One, I want to come back as a Jew, very important to me in my next life. The second one is I wanna come back married to my wife, Marcy. That's very, very critical to me. That brings me a smile to my face like it just brought to yours. And the third one, to tell you the truth, I'm still working on. I haven't figured it out yet. But if Hashem gives me enough uh, longer life, I'll figure out the third one. But that's really important to me because it says something about the person, says something about the family, and it says something about uh, you know, you. It's not what you do. It's who you are. 
I know what a lot of people, what they do, different professions, different things. It's who you are. And that makes the person. Mm-hmm. That makes the person. I'm going to share something also on, on along these lines. So something has been bothering me. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this as well. So I saw a clip recently of Mark Cuban uh, as uh, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks basketball team, a, a, a proud Jew, a uh, mm-hmm. very successful businessman, uh, a multi-billionaire, where he came out and he shared one of the stories that you're sharing, basically, of being uh, attacked when he was he was he was trying to give chizuk, he was trying to give strength to college students on yeah. campuses in terms of dealing with anti-Semitism. There are many, many prominent Jews who I follow on social media. And I've been toying with this idea, like, you know, they, they've been very quiet. They're business as usual. They're not, they're not anti-Israel, you know, chas v'shalom. They're not, I don't know, I just don't know what their feelings are. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're very prominent people. They have huge followings. They're, they're, it's business as usual. They're doing their, reg, they're putting out their regular business advice. They're doing their, like, 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 there's nothing going on. And, and it, it irks me because these are people whose content I, I imbibe, that I follow, that I admire on some level on a professional framework. And, I, I've been toying with the idea of reaching out to them and writing them a letter and saying like, hey, you know, this is, you know, you're a Jew. Like there's, there's no, this is a time where you, you, know, you need to take a stand. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. If that I mean, I haven't done it yet and maybe I'm crazy and, I, and maybe I'm, I'd be like, you know, you know, they're not going to listen to me. But I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, on this point that I'm raising. Well, listen, I think about that all the time. I think about uh, uh, how to get people engaged. I think it's uh, critical. Um, I don't understand why they don't, but I don't judge. The Talmud tells you not to judge anybody. Mm -hmm. But if you're an influential person, then try and influence them, okay? You're not not selling them on something that they don't want to buy. You're selling them to reinforce what they are already. You just want them to be more of a stand-up person, and numbers matter. I, I will tell you factually that uh, Congress uh, looks at the amount of Israel bond buyers every year, what Israel bonds sells, what other Jewish organizations do. The in-depth um, uh, amount of time, energy, and passion that are spent, and they gauge the amount that what they do in a congressional legislative budgetary matter, how much they give to Israel. And if you don't think so, you're wrong. They do. That's a metric. That's a benchmark they look for, too. And uh, they uh, they work with that all the time. They're not going to do something, if they're not in the Jewish diaspora, to do something for people who don't care about who they are. They'll do it for people who do care who they are. Again, not what you do, who you are. So I think it's uh, incumbent upon those who are not uh, uh, introverted, those who have a little passion, those who have a leadership role, and those who have significant influence on people surrounding their circle. So stand up and say something. Nobody's going to call you, as my mother used to say, nobody's going to call you a pisher for saying something that's right and honorable. So do that. Right. So do that. And have your children do that. And have your partners do that, and have your wife do that, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I think it's just part of being Jewish. I don't want to hear the same uh, sounds, uh, the feelings that they would, God forbid, uh, did feel in you know 1936. You know, as you know, sometimes when I speak in front of large congregations and the age group from the large congregation is uh, widespread. But I get up and I say, I'm blessed. I'm more blessed than a lot of you in the audience are because when I was born, there was a state of Israel. But when you were born, a lot of you, there wasn't a state. The struggle to do that, the anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, the Shoah, that was, I can't imagine. So my reason for being is make sure that I can always, always say for generations to come that when you're going to be born and your children and your grandchildren, there will be a state of Israel. No question, unequivocal and totally sustainable. We're going to do everything we can with every DNA cell in our body to make sure that happens. That we never would say 
you're born, but there is no state of Israel. That would be a failure, and I'm not uh, into failure. With this organization or any other Jew who leads great organizations that there are in this country. I'm going to we're going to wind down this interview now. I'm going to ask you what I, what I think is a difficult question. Uh and then I'll and then I'll we'll leave it for you know final thoughts. You know you mentioned you 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 articulated beautifully this idea that I know I wrote it down in my notes here if I find it quickly but this idea of I think you called it economic aliyah that you know many of us live in the diaspora uh and this is our way kind of of quote unquote making aliyah being in Israel even if we visit but you know being a more permanent presence. You know, it's hard to know, like in the sense that we didn't live in the 1930s. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't live in, in those times, you know, and there's always, you know, hindsight is 2020 where people always say, well, you know, people should have left or people should have seen the writing on the wall. And people say that about what's going on in America. And some people, many of us, myself included, kind of, there's always a resistance. There's always a pushback, like, no, 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 America's different. I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on that question. Is America really different or do we need to kind of really... You know, be thinking seriously about, uh, you know, ending the diaspora and everybody moving to Israel. Um, I think, you know, and you, and you make good points. I think about a lot of those things all the time. Uh, is America different? I think being Jewish isn't different. I think we're the same that we were in, uh, you know, the uh, before the Shoah. I think people around the world view Jews the same way they did back then. I think doing the right thing is critical for us. And I believe that uh, if you keep on doing the right thing, uh, and I've said it a few times during our talk, then you will proliferate a great optic for your culture. Do the right thing. Don't do the bad thing. Many people think all we do is, you know, we're uh, the, the, the Satan. Where all those things, you know, that uh, nobody really wants to uh, recognize. So just do the right thing. Uh, stand up. Uh, see where you can make a difference. See where you can try and educate somebody else who's not as educated, including our brothers and sisters who are Jewish. That is important. And the world can paradigm shift, as we saw in 24 hours on October 7th. Whatever people thought on the 6th, totally paradigm shift on the 7th. How do you preserve that? How strong are you? How hazak to hazak can you really push people to understand that you're doing out of love, out of passion, out of respect for everybody else on this planet? So it is uh, the voice like that that has to be heard. And in voices and numbers is strength. Always a believe that. Beautiful response. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in one last final question. Somebody like Good. yourself, who, who I think has sounds like right has has intimate uh, personal knowledge of relationships with many of the players in the Israeli government, uh, rightfully so. Maybe more on the finance side, but it sounds like on, on you know in the in the leadership echelons as well. Uh, just what are your thoughts uh, right now in terms of uh, obviously, you have to be careful what you say, but I'm saying, what, what are your thoughts in general in terms of, uh, you know, the leadership? You know, clearly there has been, a, a, you know, people have lost confidence on some level. How can you not after such a tr such a such a terrible uh, tragedy and travesty? And on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's the same people who are you know leading us in battle seemingly successfully. I'm just curious how you would respond to people who ask you about that that friction or that uh, that. Uh, you know, conflicts of emotion. Yeah, uh, you know, great question. I am, uh, I am uh, asked that many times. Uh, I've come at many times. That's because that's some of the reasons they don't want to buy bonds. Don't like the government. It's not the government. It is a position. It is uh, the amount of love you have for the state it's not the person i don't believe any person is intentionally doing anything wrong to harm the state of israel i could not conceive of that happening or that even being close to a truth and i know many of the players i've met many of the players some of the players i've known for 30 years i've met them they've called me for you know 
for help or an idea or something. So I, I felt privileged. On the other hand, they're trying to do the best they could. I think change is always good in this country. And the greatest thing I could say is they are a great democracy. They go through bumps and dents, like even this democracy does. But I think you have to keep the concept of uh, that Israel is a state of mind more than an actual state and the governance of that. Uh, you have to trust your leaders. And if you don't trust your leaders or they let you down or they have failed you or there have been intelligent failures, then as a great democracy, you can change that. Most countries around the world, you can't do that. But yeah. here you can do that. So let the people speak. And they have before. And if it's time for a change, then it's time for a change. And I think uh, the population is more they get involved, including uh, Jews in this country. Okay, the more they get involved, make the change. We have the greatest kind of democratic uh, 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 flexibility here to make a change. Go to the voting booth. If you're apathetic, shame on you. No, it's a good response. And, and I think uh, what I've heard uh, other guests of mine say over the last few weeks is that, like you're saying, so just different phraseology, whatever you may think of the government, the response of the people of Israel, right, has been phenomenal in terms mm -hmm. of people stepping up and people Unbelievable. Unbelievable. to the needs of, of, of those in need. I, a friend of mine came back from Israel just this weekend. He was telling me that that when people were saying, wow, it's amazing that you've hosted so many people in your home. If you're marveling at that, you don't understand what Israel is. That's what he was saying. So uh, so thank you, Howard, so much for your insight, your wisdom. I want to give you a blessing that your work at Israel Bond should continue to be fruitful and multiply and continue to raise uh, tremendous amounts of, of money for our state, that that money should be able to be used in many a myriad of ways that impacts uh, the people in need. And Chazak uh, Vemats, like you said, Chazak, Chazak, Menit Chazak, you should continue to be strengthened. Israel Ban should be strengthened, and we should uh, come to a point of, of peace and prosperity in the entire world at large. Thank you so much for your time. I, I believe. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Just to close, just to close for me, uh, that when somebody came up and said, gee, Howard, we bought an Israel Bond, I said, thank you so much. And I asked them, why did you buy the Israel bond? And they said, well, we want to uh, give to the people of Israel. We want to give to the, the citizens of Israel. We want to give to Eretz Israel. And I said, well, that's uh, that, that's a lot of it. But I think the other thing that you reason why you bought an Israel bond, you bought it just as much for you and your family in the diaspora as you did for Israel. Because without Israel us in the diaspora are going to be withering, frail, and could be non-existent. So that's why you buy it as much for you and your family, as much as you buy it for the citizens and the, and the, and the great state of mind of Israel. Amazing response. And I think it's, it's a truism in life that even the most altruistic acts often are inspired by some level of, of self-need or nobody would ever be motivated to do anything. So I think, uh, you know, particularly in this context, it's uh, it's a beautiful sentiment. And I always love, uh, without naming particular politicians, but I, I do appreciate when people make that point in their arguments that that the uh, United States needs Israel more than Israel needs the United States, which sounds like so counterintuitive. But uh, there are people that make that point, and it, it, is, it, is, it is well taken. And we Jews in the diaspora certainly uh, desperately need an Israel. And that's why it's uh, so essential to continue uh, supporting uh, the one democracy in the Middle East.